this video, we will cover quantum numbers. We have already alluded to several of these in other videos and have used the results that come from an understanding of them in others. We will cover four quantum numbers that describe electrons and atoms and link them to our discussions of orbitals and electron configurations. We'll discuss what the rules for the numbers are and how you can use these rules to count the number of orbitals and electrons. Quantum numbers describe the distribution of electrons. We've already talked about the energy level n, which is our first quantum number, and have briefly mentioned the quantum number l in terms of its describing the type of subshell and m sub l as the type of orbital. Now we'll actually go a bit deeper into what those mean and what they're allowed to be, as well as introducing new ones. Before we do that though, this concept can be a little abstract to think about. One analogy that works well to help get the idea of the rules is thinking about it as an address to an electron. Although this is a drastic oversimplification and it isn't strictly correct, it is helpful. Let's for instance say we are trying to describe a person on campus. We could start by saying that they must be in building 403. Now, this might describe a thousand students at a given time. Now, we could then do more describing by saying that they're in room 1100. This gets us to a lecture hall. So building 403 room 1100 may describe 400 students. By stating the building number, we're limiting ourselves to how many students we could be talking about. By stating the room number, we're limiting it further. It's also worth noting that other buildings might have a build other buildings might have a room 1100. So we need both values to know which 400 students we are talking about. Now we could get more specific and say row F, and we are describing perhaps 10 students. Again, without the first two numbers, F is very unspecific. Uh, even more specific and say chair number one. Now we're describing one person. Uh, being totally cisnormative for the sake of this analogy, we can then further describe the person by saying, are they male or female? This is a good starting point for an analogy for how quantum number logic works. Um, it breaks down in how the actual science occurs, but hopefully this can help you understand the logic flow a little bit. Our descriptive numbers are called N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. We've already talked about N. And in a way, we've already talked about L as well. I just haven't really explained it as far as numbers go. N is the energy level. This is the same N that we discussed with the Bohr model of the atom. L is what we've been calling subshells. This says whether it's an S, D, P, or F orbital. We didn't talk about them in terms of numbers yet, but now we will. The next one is M sub L. This is going to be used to differentiate between the p orbitals or between the different d orbitals, etc. We've already discussed that each orbital holds two electrons. We did this in electron configurations. M sub s differentiates between the two electrons. Depending on your background, you may be used to thinking about an electron as spin up or spin down. Uh, this is a better way of discussing that. Let's go into each in more detail. N is the principal quantum number. As mentioned before, this is the same N that we talked about when discussing the Bohr model of the atom. Each of the quantum numbers has rules about what they are allowed to equal. N is allowed to be any positive integer. So one, two, three, and so forth all the way up. Of course, at some point we don't have any elements which have electrons with that high of an N, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't theoretically exist and isn't theoretically allowed. The quantum number L is used to designate subshells or orbitals that have different shapes. We've talked about orbitals such as S, P, D, and F, but now we can tie numbers to those. The S is equal to zero, P equal to one, D equal to two, F equal to three, and four is equal to G. For a given energy level, S can be anything from zero up to N minus one. So in the first energy level where N is equal to one, the only orbital is L equals zero or an S. If you move up to the N equals two level, then L can equal zero and one, which means in the N equals two orbital, we have S and P orbitals. 
This is how the allowed orbitals that we talked about in previous videos were determined. Now we have the reasoning behind it. It's important to remember that the L values start with zero and zero is S. I see a lot of silly errors because people are writing out lists of L values and names and forgetting that L starts with zero. Let's do one quick example. What orbitals are present for the N equals four energy level? Well, L is allowed to equal zero up to N minus one. So if N is equal to four, then that would mean that L is allowed to equal zero, one, two, or three. Or in other words, that in the fourth energy level, it has S, P, D, and F orbitals. M sub L is the magnetic quantum number. This distinguishes orbitals that have the same N and L, but have different orientations. For example, we've discussed that there are three different p orbitals in each energy level. This comes out of the allowed possibilities for m sub l. m sub l is allowed to equal plus l all the way to minus l and all the integers in between. So in other words, if l is equal to 1 or we have a p orbital, then m sub l is allowed to equal negative 1, 0, and 1. Since there are three allowed values, there are three p orbitals. You can see the table for more examples of allowed values of m sub l. Remember that each l value within an energy shell has its own set of m sub l values, right? So one has a different, or l equals one has a different set of m sub values, m sub l values than l equals two. Just like our analogy, each room number would have its own set of lettered rows. If n equals three, but we are talking about a p orbital where l is equal to one, we are still only allowed values of negative one, zero, and one, regardless of the n value. So the short version of that is l sets the m sub l value, not n, right? So you have to work down from n to get l to get m sub l. Now let's take a look at our question about the fourth energy shell from the last slide and extend it a bit. How many orbitals are there in the fourth energy shell? Since we know that there are S, P, D, and F orbitals, or stated a different way that L is allowed to equal zero, one, two, and three, we can see how many of each orbital exists. When L equals zero, M sub L is only allowed to equal zero. So that means that there's only one S orbital, right? So the zero doesn't mean there's no orbitals. It means that there is an orbital with a value of zero. And since there's only one orbital, there's only one allowed value, there's just one 1s one orbital. Or sorry, in this case, one 4s orbital. When L is equal to one, the m sub L value is allowed to equal negative one, zero, and one. And so there are three p orbitals within this energy level. When L is equal to two, m sub l is allowed to equal negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And so there are 5d orbitals. And then when l equals 3, m sub l is allowed to equal negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. And so there are 7 orbitals. You can count them like tick marks, right? Each value equals a tick mark. Add all of these up, and you get 16. So there are 16 total orbitals in the n equals 4 energy shell. Here are some pictures of the orbitals that we've been talking about. Let's fill in the possible quantum numbers for n equals 3 level. Since n equals 3, l is allowed to equal 0, 1, and 2. This means that the third energy level has s, p, and d orbitals. That should align with what I told you in the electron configuration. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. Now. For each L level, there are possible M sub L numbers. For L equals zero, or the S orbital, M sub L equals zero. For the L equals one level, or the p orbital, m sub l equals negative one, zero, and one. 
and for the d orbital, m sub l equals negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, and 2. You should check out the drawings of the f orbitals in your book, um, but I'm not going to make you draw or recognize these, but they are kind of interesting. We've talked about orbitals quite a bit now, and we are also talking about these quantum numbers. So let's link this back up to some of what we discussed about wave functions earlier in the quarter. I mentioned that the orbitals are actually graphs of the equations that describe the electrons. Just for fun, let's look at these quickly. Here I'm showing you a picture from a textbook. Um, these are the equations that make the pictures we've been showing you as orbitals. Now, when you take lab third quarter, you'll get the chance to use Spartan program to dive a little deeper into what orbitals look like. Uh, and this is not the sort of thing that we would ever make you really do anything with in this class. These wave functions are for your information. They look neat. If you want to look really smart when you're studying at home with your parents, this is a good slide for that. Um, but we're not using these. I just wanted to show you them. Because it's one thing for us to say, oh, it's math, they're equations, isn't that cool? Uh, but it's also nice to be able to show you what it looks like, even if we're not gonna do things with it. Now the last of the quantum numbers is the spin quantum number. This number describes the spin of the electron. Because every electron in the atom must have at least one quantum number different from each other, it also sets how many electrons are allowed in an orbital. Because if you're within a particular orbital, n, l, m sub l are all going to be the same. And so the only thing left to be different is m sub s. In one way, we have kind of talked about this, in this quantum number, when talking about electron configurations. Um, we talk about electrons having a spin up or spin down. Uh, this is similar to the idea of the negative one half, positive one half spins but they're not actually particularly associated. So it's, it doesn't mean like, oh, if you have a plus one half, that's gotta be spin up or anything like that. Um, each orbital may have an electron in it that has a plus one half and an electron in it that has a negative one half, okay? There are no other rules for this quantum number. That's it. This means there are two allowed electrons per orbital um, since those are the only two possible values. So let's continue with the discussion on the fourth energy shell. We've decided which orbitals can be present. We know how many orbitals are present. Now let's figure out how many electrons maximum would be allowed in the fourth energy shell. If we have 16 orbitals and there are two electrons per orbital, that leaves us with 32 orbitals that are allowed. Let's do a few examples where we decide if a set of quantum numbers is allowed and if not, why? Let's look at the first set. Look at the numbers listed and decide if this is allowed. You may need to pause to give yourself a bit more time. So this set isn't allowed. Where's the problem? Well, if n equals one, then L is only allowed to equal zero. L can't equal one. So this one must be wrong. Now look at this one. Pause, take a moment, decide what's wrong and why, and then come back. If you said no, then you are correct. What's wrong with this set? Well, if n is equal to three, then L is allowed to equal one. That's true. So the first part is okay. The n equals three, L equals one is okay. The problem becomes the m sub L equals negative two. While it's true that in the n equals three level, you could have this, right? If n were to equal three and l were to equal two, then m sub l would be allowed to equal negative two. But this l value is what sets m sub l. So since l is equal to one, m sub l can only be negative one, zero, and one. Next one, pause if you need to. Hopefully this one jumped out right away. Um, m sub s is never allowed to equal one. It's only plus one or negative one if we're in our universe. Uh, I do admittedly like to give you alternate universe rules to make sure that you can follow rule sets and don't just have things memorized. But in our rule set, in our universe, m sub s plus one half minus one half, that's it. 
we don't really even have to look at the other ones. Um, it's just an automatic no. But let's go ahead and look and see if the other ones are okay. So for n equals 2, L is allowed to equal 1, right? So that's the n equals 2 energy level. L equals 1 is P orbitals. That's okay. This is okay. M sub L equals negative 1. That's fine. Because for L equals 1, it's negative 1, 0, and 1. So we're okay there. Just this one is the problem. All right. Last one for this video, or for this slide. N equals 3. L equals 2. M sub L equals negative 2. M sub S equals negative 1. This one is allowed. I had to give you at least one that was allowed. We've now defined the four quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. We've talked about why they are allowed to be the numbers that they are, and how that determines possible orbitals within an energy shell, the number of each orbital, and the number of electrons. And so these are all the sorts of problems that you would need to be able to do. And we'll, of course, always do more examples in class.